find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. I think maybe one of the reasons people fear admitting their sins to Jesus is the treatment we too often receive from people who profess to be followers of Jesus. I mean, we're fallible, but the situation is worse than mere fallibility. We're fallen. We're not what we ought to be. And the scripture tells us that all of us have become have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All like sheep have gone astray, we've turned to our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And yet, I often find Christians who think that now that I'm a Christian, somehow this doesn't apply to me anymore. I'm not like a filthy rag. I'm not like a sheep gone astray. I am higher than that. But not you. I once went to a pastor before I was a pastor myself and told him I was having problems in a certain area and I really was confused. How do I deal with this? He looked me in the eye and said, I've never had a problem with that since I became a Christian. Okay, well as I crawled out underneath the door uh, I, I resolved never to tell that man a problem I was having again. If you, Scripture tells us to bear our burdens with one another and confess our sins to one another. But if you don't feel safe doing that, you're not going to do it. No matter how spiritual it might be. Please beat me some more. I, I don't feel bad. Calvin and Hobbes, there's no t situation so terrible that you can't add a little guilt to it and make it even worse. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, let's take a look. Hebrews chapter 4. And let's begin with verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before our, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's pray. Father, lay bare and open our eyes to what's going on. Teach us from your word, touch our hearts through your spirit, and help us to go from this place empowered to do your will. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now you need to understand, in the ancient world, most swords carried a single edge. They were easier to make that way. They were stronger to make that way. But the Romans came up with, instead of these big, long, massive scimitar swinging things, they came up with a very short two-edged sword that was good for both thrusting and hacking. And it was, it was a marvel of military technology in the ancient world. It cut both ways. But here the lesson for you and I is, is our the lesson is the word of God cuts both ways too so the lesson is careful you don't cut yourself it penetrates everything it takes it all it goes to the marrow and the all those things that it says there the joint and the marrow now the joint that's an interesting point because I'm not talking about combat in combat you're not going for, I think I'll see if I can break this guy's joint. That's not, you don't have time to do that. The picture is actually here of the priest's sacrificial knife. Because they did go and cut the joints. The picture there of dividing joints and marrow and soul and spirit is added there because it's not just a physical act we're talking about here. The word of God is not actually a physical sword. It's like the priest's sacrificial knife. It is like 
if they had the, top, the thinking in those days and they did not, a surgeon's scalpel. It can get right into the tiniest little spots of your soul and spirit. And isn't that how the Word of God works, if you're really honest with yourself? I read the Word of God, and I, if I'm being fleshly, I think, you know, Brother Bob really needs to hear this. But if I'm being honest, I say, oh, God, please, you just that just cut right to my heart. I see myself in that. Of course, the Word, the Word of God, the Word represents God. What the Word says is what God says. The Word, we're supposed to study it, we're supposed to interpret it, and more importantly, we're supposed to apply it to our lives. When you read God's Word and you go, oh yes, amen, hallelujah, and you don't do anything about it, you haven't really finished the process. The question when you finish reading scripture is always, what do you want from me about this world? What does this mean to me? How does this affect the way I live? I've been reading through some of the minor prophets, and I've never gone one after the other reading through them. And I'm finding more of a cohesive message in the Minor Prophets, then, you know, at school you just go, okay, now we're going to study Zechariah, now we're going to study Matthew, now we're going to jump over here and study Genesis. Now, And when you do it like that piecemeal, you don't really get this whole unified picture. But when you start reading the prophets one after the other, and I keep reading these things that Jesus ends up saying, woe to those shepherds who are not shepherding my flock. Woe kind of applies to me. What does that mean? And here's the point that's the most important, I think, for you and I as an everyday Christian to understand. See, you know, Robin and I will sit there and go, well, you know, the theological impact of this passage. Don't do that. The, the Bible is not the Dell book of anagrams, crosswords, and puzzles. Don't seek deep hidden meaning, oh, the olive tree on the Mount of Olives really stands. Don't do that. Look for the plain, simple message. The shepherds who are not shepherding my flock faithfully are going to be judged. That's pretty plain. Okay? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things that you desire will be added to you. That's pretty plain. You really don't need to... I wonder what that really means. Seek God's kingdom. That's what it means. And so as we're studying and looking at the Word of God, it helps to think of what God's attitude is. And that's there in verse 13. Nothing in all creation, is hidden from God's sight. And that includes you. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. I like the King James Version there. Everything is naked and open. God doesn't look at the mistake you made today or the fall you had or the thing you do and go, Oh, how did that happen? You're not going to blow it big time and then dig a hole and cover it up and God not know about it. It's just not going to happen. And so it behooves us as people who say we're following God to recognize that our lives are open and laid bare daily and moment by moment before God and to live honestly that way. One of the things I like about basketball is is it true in professional basketball? I know it is true in high school and college basketball. When you get fouled, you stick your hand up. Is that true in professional basketball? Not as much anymore. I always admired that in, in college and high school ball. They didn't like doing it. But the fact is, that was me. 
You know what, Christian? That might be our attitude. Instead of, we prefer this one. He did it! <laughs> God sees us. We're open and laid bare before Him. His, revert, his word reveals His will to us that speaks to our heart and lays us bare. And so it behooves us to simply be honest about it. And it doesn't say, therefore, go out and find everybody's fault because they're all laid there and open before you. It's talking about you before God. What do you do? Don't compare yourself with other people. That's easy. I pick me on a good day and you on a bad day. and Woo! I'm feeling pretty good. You know what? Compare yourself to Jesus Christ and see how you do. Let God's word judge you, not you judge other people. When you sit down and say, Oh God, I am not what I ought to be before you, and recognize that God loves you anyway, you will find yourself judging people less. I think that's a good thing. Verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, for we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. Now remember, this is talking about to Jewish believers who are in Jerusalem at the time the city of Rome, of the, the nation of Rome, is besieging Jerusalem and telling them, because there are, there are other Jews saying, you've got to give up this Christianity nonsense and stand together with Judaism and, and defend the city and defend the temple and give up that Jesus nonsense. And they were... Vacillating, and that's why this epistle was written. No, stand your ground. Even if the city is destroyed, even if the temple is destroyed, even if everything in Judaism is destroyed, what did we have in the beginning? Jesus is superior to the angels because he's the creator. Jesus is superior to Moses because the son is greater in the house than any servant of the house. And Jesus is superior to the law because he's the author of it. And so even if those physical things are destroyed, follow Jesus. He is superior. And so if the city is destroyed, if the high priest loses his function, if the temple is gone, follow Jesus. He's superior. We have a high priest who's greater than the high priest that stands over there. Because he never ends. He died once, but he rose from the dead, conquering death. And therefore, he lives forevermore. There are two reasons Christ can intercede for us as a high priest. One, he's been tempted just like you. Tempted in every way, just like we are. And two, he successfully resisted that temptation. Hebrews 5 tells us Jesus learned obedience through suffering temptation. I remember I had an ongoing argument with a guy one time who firmly believed that Jesus couldn't really be tempted because he's God, therefore uh, it was only an apparent temptation. And I kept arguing, why don't you try reading the Bible? Instead of telling me theoretical theology, look at what the scripture says. Of course he was tempted. Well, how could he be tempted? That His problem was he had a theology that wasn't allowing him to read the Word of God. Don't make that mistake. Let me help you out. Robin's a good theologian, but theology is not what saves you. Theology is a human construct to try to understand what God has said in His Word. I have certain theological ways that I go about arranging things in the Bible and understanding concepts, and if my theology gets in the way of God's word, my theology is what's wrong. Be careful. 
We do that all the time in other parts of our lives, too. We do it in politics, and we do it in sociology, and we do it all. Well, it's got to be this way. I heard a guy on the radio the other day say, well, uh, businesses are not spending money because um, they're afraid the government will hurt them, and so they should spend money. Okay, that'd be swell. But they're not. So what do you do? Well, you ought to. But they're not. You can't just wave a magic wand and make people change what they do. You can't just say, it would be good if we can't just got along. Yeah, it'd be swell. But they're not. You, you have to look at the world as it is and see people as they are. And the problem is, if you don't recognize human nature, in this situation, economics. Human nature means, I do what's good for me. I do what's good for me and my family. I don't look at the world and go, you know, the world would be a better place if I gave everything I own away. I don't do that. Jesus told me to do that. Do I do that? No. That's human nature. Now, there have been times when I've graciously doled out a fiver here, you know, to somebody. I'm really belaboring the point, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you can't take your sociology or your polit politics or your theology and allow them to determine for you what God's Word says. Because at some point, your sociology or your politics or your theology is going to be tainted by human nature. And here's the other hard part of it. Telling you that your politics or your sociology or your theology is really not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You and God. My job is to say, what am I doing? See, we don't want to hear that because the pastor is obviously God's representative, you know, waiting for a vacancy in the Trinity and everything I do is right and true and honor. You know what? Try reading the New Testament. You stand before God. You don't stand before me who stands before God. I'm not your representative to God. I'm not a high priest. You stand before God, serving as a priest. That's what Scripture says. And so because of who Jesus is, you go directly to Him, not through me. He knows me, and still loves me. Of course He knows everything. He's God. But because of His unique perspective as both God and man, well, what Hebrews 5 said, when it says Jesus learned obedience through suffering temptation, that word learn means experience. He knows obedience because he lived it. He did it. And it's the same way with his knowledge of your weaknesses in your life. Because he faced temptation and beat it, he knows how hard it is in your life. And see, you're tempted, the devil will then go and go, well, but he beat it, and you can't, loser. And so, he looks down on you because he beat it, and you can't. Don't do that. That is not what Scripture says. That's what the devil says. Christ knows, because he's both man and God, he knows us through experience. I like what it says in the second half. Here, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He conquered death, he conquered sin, because he's God. He's not God who came here and put on a human outfit and pretended to be a man, but he is God who spent nine months in the womb before being born in lowly circumstances and being raised by a lower middle class poor family 
and learning to get a job. I mean, he uh, he worked as a carpenter. You know, in a day when they didn't even have a, a good drill. He had to do a job just like you and get up and go and do it every day. He had to have little brothers and sisters that followed him around and his parents said, you're, the char you're in charge, we expect you to be a good example for your brothers and sisters. He had to go to school. He had to do all the things like we do. And so he knows because he, it's true for him just as much as it's true for you. Nobody's going to be able to stand before God on Judgment Day and say, you don't know what my life was like. Because he does. He did it. He lived it. And so his death, his, his uh, conquest over temptation, and then his death over sin, did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. We couldn't resist temptation. We couldn't climb out of the hole of sin that we were in. But Jesus did it for us. We have a high priest who is both the priest, and the sacrifice. And that's an incredible, amazing thing. And finally, verse 16. Because of all of that, because of who Jesus is, because of the Word of God that touches our heart, that cuts between the joint and the marrow, because we have a high priest who understands us, didn't sin, verse 16, let us then... Approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. That is an incredible invitation. If you've never thought about Hebrews 4.16 before, this ought to be one of the verses you memorize. Let us there, I still have it memorized in King James. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is an invitation to you. Come before God's throne with confidence, not arrogance. Hey, I'm here because God, you're just lucky to have me around. But with the confidence of a personal invitation from God to come before his throne and to plead the blood of Jesus. And I can go before God's throne and say, God, Forgive me, a sinner. And he does because he promised that to us. He invited that and he provides that. God, we talk about God's grace. Let me tell you something. God's grace doesn't mean he ignores sin. He didn't, he doesn't ignore sin when he looks at you. He deals with sin. That's what the whole death of Jesus was about. To conquer it. To beat it. And one day it will be finally beaten. If you remember late Raiders of the Lost Ark or your Sunday school pictures, you see the Ark of the Covenant there. And on the top of the Ark, you see the two angels facing one another. That is called the mercy seat or propitiation, which means nothing, nothing to us. Once a year, the high priest would take the sacrifice, the blood, go through the curtain into the Holy of Holies before the Ark of the Covenant and meet the Lord face to face at the mercy seat. The Lord would speak to the high priest from the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. Only one man, only one day out of the year. In Christ, and this is what the meaning of the veil of the temple rent from top to bottom when Jesus rose from the dead. In Christ, you may approach that throne at any time. That mercy seat. That place of forgiveness. That's the picture there. And I want you to get that. Someone has said that reward is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. God doesn't offer us a reward or mercy. He offers us grace. And if you look at God's grace for your life and all the, the abundance that he pours out and saying to you that everything that is Jesus is yours, if you look at that and you don't say, oh, come on, you can't mean that, God. That's too much. You don't get it. 
It is too much. Because it's not a reward. And it's not God just saying, well, never mind, forget. It's God pouring out. What was Jesus' picture? Given and be given to you. Like pouring out grain into a basket. Good measure, poured out, shaken down, pressed down, and overflowing. No merchant puts grain in a basket like that. That's wasteful. God does. That's how God gives. It's not how you give or I give. It's how God gives. It's wasteful. It's lavish. It's, come on, God, are you kidding me? Nope. Let us approach God's throne for daily grace. Let us approach God's throne for the strength we need to live. Let us approach God's throne for help in time of temptation. For power to live on a daily basis. Don't wait for some big disaster to happen before you go to God's throne. Visit Him daily. You don't have to wait for one day out of the year, the Day of Atonement. You can do it right now where you're sitting. You ever thought about how many sins you've committed in your life? Oh, one a day? Twice on Sunday? For the sake of brevity, let's just say one. So that means in a year you've committed 365 sins. Everybody knows I don't do math well, so i got to keep it simple here. 365 year, sins a year against God's righteousness. So in 10 years, you rack up 3,650 sins. In 25 years, you've accumulated 9,125 sins. And Eric can tell me where I'm wrong and all this out later on. Uh, but right now, we'll just continue the point here. But in a lifetime of 85 years, you would have committed 31,025 sins against God's holy nature. And if we were serious about the real numbers... It'd be scary how often I sin against God. It's serious. We are sinners. If we started talking real numbers, whew. but you know what? God's not doing that. We might do that. God doesn't do that. God says he has taken our sins and separated them as far as the east is from the west. He's dropped them into the depths of the sea to remember them no more. And that's because of what Jesus did for us. We like to count. God likes to forgive. I challenge you to fall on that forgiveness daily. Let's pray. Father, we are awed and overwhelmed with your graciousness, with the lavish, wasteful nature of your love and forgiveness to us. Help us, Lord, to seek it daily and to offer it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.